Hi everybody, um, it's Ian Brown again and um, we're going to do another webinar today um, looking at um, creativity and in this funny time of the pandemic what sort of things can we be doing at home. Um, as we've done in the past we've, we've looked at um, some really practical ideas and things that you might enjoy doing with your child um, and I'm going to do the same thing as I've done in the past and use my grandchild um, her name is Riley and she's um, four years old. She's going to school next year. She's been in preschool for the last two or three years. And she's um, my little model. I test things out on her and I sit with her and we work together and do some nice creative stuff. And hopefully that'll be, give you some ideas of the things that you can do. If you're joining for the first time, welcome. Um, if you're haven't been here before, it's a very simple process because what we're trying to do is to um, provide you with lots of nice things that you can do just in your kitchen, um, in your home, um, places where you can sort of have um, equipment and things that are really easy. But also if you've got an opportunity um, in Australia at the moment with, the, um, with lockdowns and things, we are allowed to go outside and visit. And so what we're going to do today is um, we're going to actually have a look at um, a sculpture walk that Riley and I went on together um, and have a look at some of the sculptures and see how that you might be able to use something similar in your, your hometown um, that you could actually do with your um, child as well. Now, what we always do is, what we've been doing in the last few weeks is we always start off with some sort of activity and then we move from the activity into a bit of theory and then we talk about um, the Voices of Children project at the end. But what I want to do is this time is just turn everything on its head. Um, and what I'd like to do is actually talk to you a little bit about the Voices of Children project, which you can be involved in, um, and you and your child can be involved in, and what, what we've been trying to do and get you to do over the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to um, just switch on a presentation now, and I'm going to talk over the top of that presentation. Um, and so hopefully, we, um, this will work and you'll be able to see my PowerPoint presentation, you'll see my messy computer desk. But anyway, so our Voices of Children project, um, hopefully you can see this, is, is the project where we're actually getting you to um, take some photographs with your child and more importantly, get your child to take some photographs. And we're going to collect those photographs and put them together um, in a, a special gallery space um, in the next coming weeks. Now, the first two weeks, um, what we got you to do was to actually um, take some pictures of your children drawing. And you can still do that. I mean, you can still catch up now if you've only just started to listen to the webinars and you haven't done this, that's fine. You've got plenty of time to do it. So um, get your child to um, do some drawings and then you can take some pictures of your child drawing and then more importantly get your child to take pictures of their drawings um, and, and get them to take some and then take some where they're actually holding up their artworks. So we did one on printing and we did one on drawing and we did one on um, clay work for the first three weeks and then last week we started something new and what it was is that we wanted you to talk about looking up with your child. Now when children actually take photographs, you never know what they're going to take. So I gave my, my camera to um, my granddaughter Riley and we went outside to have a look and see what she would actually choose as she was looking up. Lots of kids like to choose things like the sky. Um, that's the obvious one. And, and the whole time what we're hoping to do is to get them to talk about what can you see. So before you go out for your walk, ask them, what can you see when you look up in the air? And they will come up with lots of things. So come up with trees and they'll come up with the sky or whatever. Sometimes they don't think about being inside a building and looking up. So you've got some fabulous buildings in your area that you might be able to just wander down, have a look around and see. It doesn't necessarily have to be outside. It could actually be in your house as well. But your beautiful mosques, your beautiful places of religion, which have these fantastic patterns in it. 
And if you look at most of the insides of these buildings, what you have is a lot of patterns and a lot of shapes that are being repeated. And you could talk to your child here about um, things like symmetry, because I mean, all of um, a lot of the mosques that you can actually go into as a public member is that you will look at them and you'll find that they're actually divided into sy sy symmetrical shapes. In other words, you can slice that shape in half and look on each side of it, as you do in this photo, and fold it over as if you're just folding it and it will actually match up on the other side. So that's what symmetry means. This was my visit to um, the Abu Dhabi Louvre when I was there last time. This is one of my photographs and I just love the, this building because as well as having these spectacular views outside of the building, you can always look up and you've got those beautiful, beautiful shapes up in the ceiling, up in the roof line, um, which looks fantastic. So if you're close by to some nice, interesting buildings, take your child out, have a look, find those buildings, go for a walk and see the sorts of things that they would do. But ask them the questions. Ask them, what do you think that you might see? Here's another one where I've taken one inside of your beautiful mosque. And this one inside Abu Dhabi Louvre as well. This is a typical one that a child might take where they're looking up through the sky. Um, and as I said, they might even just start to have a look through their bedroom so they can look up and what do you see when you look up? Because quite often, that's the other thing with young children is that what we tend to do is that we place things a little bit out of their space so they, they're a bit higher. If you go into um, a, a Reggio Emilia type preschool, um, what you will find is that a lot of the artworks have been lowered so that they're down at the children's eye level. Because quite often what we do um, as parents and as teachers is sometimes we raise the artworks up a little bit too high and bit, they have trouble seeing them. If you've got an interesting bedroom, that's what your child might take. They might like to look at the lights. Now, this is when I put my granddaughter, we went for a drive and this is her father's car and she decided that she would start her journey of looking up. Now, these photos have been taken by her. Um, and what happened is that we just went for a drive and she looked up at the buildings. Um, she started to look up. And then when we got out into a park, we found these fantastic trees. Now, this is interesting because an adult would tend to take the tree from the side. But what we've got here is we've got Riley taking a picture of the tree looking up. So that's the view that the child would have anyway. So the natural view a child would have is often looking up at things not looking straight ahead. So these are her photographs. She took my phone um, and recorded them and um, took these lovely pictures of this, um, this tree looking down from the bottom and then looking at the roots as she's looking up. We then walked along the boardwalk at Sydney and she, she found lots and lots of different things that, that she could see from looking down. Sorry, from, look, where, from her position looking up and she's got the Ferris wheel. And we have a, um, like a Coney Island type thing, which we call Luna Park, which she just loved at uh, walking past. And this is her photograph of looking right up at the entrance um, from underneath. And that's not generally the, the viewpoint that we would take as adults. We would tend to stand back. I've got one that I'll show you. But this is her image. This is how she took it. Um, I let her just use the phone on her own. Um, she looked at the Harbour Bridge, which we walked under, which is a massive structure. And then this is the one um, of her standing in front of the, the Luna Park entrance. But this is probably typical of what an adult would take, um, the photograph an adult would take, not necessarily the photograph that a child would take. A child would probably take something slightly different. So that's, that's what our Voices of Children is about. So, so what we're hoping you to do, want you to do is to actually collect the images hold on to them, um, and then we will tell you how you can actually upload those images. And if you're happy to have your child um, go up onto the website, then that's fine. Um, and the, obviously these images um, you have to select and you have to actually discuss. I've got a... Okay, um, somebody's just asked me whether there'll be a certificate after attending the webinar. Look, I'll, I'll put that to the organisers. I don't attend to that side of it, but um, I can't see any reason why that couldn't be the case, but I will certainly talk to them. Um, thank you very much for that question. It's nice to get some questions coming up. 
Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is today's I was trying to figure out some activity that you could do at home. And again, all of the activities I've got, the art activities, tend to be something that you can find in the home or something that you can find in your kitchen. Um, and that's what we've done most of the time. So what I would like to do this time is that we're going to do something which is, we're just going to do something really simple. Um, and we're going to use some tin foil um, and again, I've tested this one out with my granddaughter um, and we're just going to use some things like a, um, a whisk and then a wooden spoon, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm very, very keen on parents um, using um, professional artists and artworks um, to get kids stimulated and excited about doing art and doing something really exciting. And it's a really good thing to, to start talking about art and artworks with younger children. And it doesn't matter how old they are, you can start as young as you want and actually get them to have a look at um, some of the things that um, real artists, real artists, um, as opposed to their own artworks and what might inspire them or what might motivate them. And quite often, I mean, I'm an artist myself and I'm a painter um, and often I will look at other artists work to get some ideas or to be motivated or to get some, um, some particular techniques that you can use and young children are the same. So it's, it's important then if you can actually do that and um, start with it. So I'm going to take you back to another, um, another PowerPoint present world. Let me just get rid of that one. Um, I'm going to take you to another presentation now. Um, and this is a really, this one will explain the idea much better in terms of what, what you sh should be doing um, and the sorts of good fun things that you can do with sculpture. So hopefully the, my sc screen is coming up. My screen sharing, let me just. Okay, I'll just stop that for a moment and we'll try that one again because for some reason it's frozen. Okay, let's try it again this time. That was a bit weird. Now, let's try it. Sharing the screen, going to the PowerPoint. Uh, that looks better. Okay. So I'm going to talk you through this one. So the artist that we're talking about is Alberto Giacometti. Now, he's um, a sculptor and he has died, but his, his works are really quite well known across lots of museums. And he tends to do these long elongated shapes of people. Um, and here's one that's actually at the Louvre, at, at your Louvre. So I took Riley on a walk um, and we went out in, during the pandemic to actually have a look at um, a sculpture walk, which is along the foreshore of Sydney. So these are some of the images as, that we're, as we're walking along. And what they've got here is a, um, a series of little sculptures that are sitting in a garden along the foreshore. And it tends to be um, little, little tiny sculptures that come from a book, which is an Australian book, which is based on um, if I just go back to that one, if you have a look at this one, these things up here are what we call banksias. They're a special plant in Australia. And May Gibbs actually um, used these as the basis for a, a children's book. And so all of these little figures that we have here are, are little figures that have actually, if I just go back one, um, they're little figures. This one's a, of a koala called Blinky Bill. And this sculpture walk just takes you along and you can just take it sort of like a little treasure hunt to see if you can actually find the sculptures along the way. They're all made out of bronze and um, some are made out of clay. And so what we did was we just went along until we could find this little walk and we started to talk about sculptures and the sorts of things that you can see. Now this one is the, the face of that Lunar Park, which is quite well known. I'll just go back to that one. And if you look at that one, you can see that it's um, really popular with children. They like the idea of it. Now, the other thing that I've 
been doing here is if I just go back one, the photographs on the left, you'll notice here, Riley's actually taken, a, I've taken a picture of Riley with the sculpture. The one on the right is actually her photograph that she's taken with my phone. And so what I've included here is the same thing. Here's a picture of her here with this funny little guy. And this is the photograph that she's taken. This is a photograph of her with the sculpture. And then she took my phone and then she took this photograph here. So that's what we're hoping that you might get your child to do in this series is actually to take some pictures of, um, these are her photographs again, and take some pictures of the um, sculptures that you have got around your place. So these are um, bush babies, what we call bush babies. It's part of the book. Um, if we go back to that one, if you have a look, they're little, um, they're made out of gum nuts. So this here, the little hats are gum nut babies and that's what they call them, which is just a local book. So you may have a local children's book um, that you could use as a basis of this as well. The other thing, the nice part about it is this one here is the Banksia man. He's a bit of an angry man that's in the children's book. and the, oh, let me just go back to this one. These are the banksias that grow in the tree and this man is sort of a representation of them. So that was a bit of fun trying to find the banksia men um, in, the, in the plants that we have. So we ended our walk, it was a bit of a rainy day that day, but it was a lot of fun. And we um, sat and talked about sculptures and what are they made from? And then we went home and we decided that we were going to make a, a geo sculpture ourselves. So we just used oil um, and we started to build the shapes of the body and we stood and we put our arms in the air and we bent. And you can see on the left there, we, the sculptures the, are ones that Riley has made herself that she's actually joined together and formed these shapes. So we actually had a look at the, the types of um, sculptures that Giacometti would be making himself, and then we re recreated it. So how easy is it to do that one? Well, the first thing is that, again, if you've got a, an artist that you can use, a sculptor, a painter or whatever, please try and do that with your child. And then even just talk about the sorts of things that are important. Um, and then what we just did with this one, is I've got a few of the things here to do. So it's just foil wrap that you use for cooking. Um, and then it was really quite easy. Now, it's, it's nice if you actually have um, some type of spine in the back of it. And it doesn't need to be like a wooden spoon. It could actually be something just like a stick. Um, and the idea is, is that once you actually cover this in foil, um, and tighten it up and obviously um, Giacometti when he did his sculptures what he does is that it's a bronze sculpture so it's actually been molten um, metal um, and they make it out of clay first of all and then they pour it in etc but what we're trying to do here is just to do something which is slightly um, similar in some ways now what what's important is that what we talked about what I talked about with Riley was that, you know, it's not a normal body. It's the body is sort of long and stretched. And if you look, you know, go and have a look at those works in the, in the Louvre. His works, are, uh, there's a couple of women and they're long and thin. So the legs are too long and the arms are too long. But that was actually much more fun to do than if we just tried to recreate it ourselves. So give yourself something that's going to start off with a nice bit of a spine feel to it. And then what you do is that you can then start to use the bits of foil, very, very cheap, very sort of, and get the kids to the children to actually, um, you know, make shapes and do things like that. And then what you start to do is you start to build those shapes so that you've actually got something which is, um, and what I, what I did with Riley was I would say to her, now hold your arm, what, what does your arm look like? So you're going to actually get that shape. Um, or you could have it straight out if you wanted to, or where is your elbow and it's going to bend in a particular way. But then you let them do it. And if you can see this, you don't necessarily even need to put tape or anything onto it because what's happening is, is that you end up with these sort of shapes and you can then start to build up the legs or whatever. 
And what I did then was that you can actually just then start to place them um, on, onto a board. I just used a cutting board, a wooden cutting board, and put some tape across the bottom of it, which actually held it in place. And these things, she, she had actually more fun um, making the, 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 the shapes of the body and what they could be doing, um, as opposed to just normal sorts of, um, you know, like a, a, a wire sculpture or something like that. Stick a bit of sticky tape there if you need to, but if it's, you can see that it actually sticks quite well on its own. And the other thing with it is, is if you look at um, Giacometti's work, he, they, he tends to have multiples, or well, certainly when the gallery set them up, they might put a, a couple of things there. The other thing that Riley enjoyed was that um, she had a family of them. So it's like recreating a children's drawing where, you know, quite often what they will do is they won't just draw um, dad. They will always, younger children will always want to draw dad and mum, my brother, myself, and the, the pets and the animals as well. Um, they rarely will just draw one, one member of the family. They like to put the whole family in. Um, and so this is exactly the same. All she wanted to do was to actually recreate so that she had a family of, of, of people that she could put there. And we had them set up um, and, and put them into, um, onto this board and just positioned them so that they were really nice on the board. And they were there for days because she just loved the idea of having it set up like a display. And you can go really wild if you want to, and you can make really long ones, um, and you can actually hang them um, because the foil is so expensive, uh, sorry, so inexpensive. It's a nice tactile sort of a material that you can actually roll, squish, um, tighten it on itself, put a little bit of sticky tape or a bit of um, sellotape around it if you wanted to actually do it that way but you can actually make these really long ones in actual fact, larger than themselves because most of Giacometti's work is actually more than lifelike. It's actually quite, it's quite a large one. All right, so um, that's, that's what this, this um, and again, like I said, you can use anything because you're not going to wreck it. The other thing is that you're just covering it with foil and then you can take it off after they're, they're finished with it and, um, and go out and collect some sticks if you want to. So my, my take home from this one would be, it's a nice, simple um, activity to do with children. It's not, it's not a quick activity, it does take some time. It's much more about them solving the problems. It's a bit like this, for example, if you, you know, I, I would just let your child um, go and see if they can figure out how those arms are going to be attached in some way. You might demonstrate a little bit for them. Don't take it off them. Let them actually figure it out. I mean, I was watching her trying to figure out how she was going to get, a, get them to stand once she had the whole family because the one would knock the next one over, which would knock the next one over. And that's fine because part of the creative process is allowing children to actually have some nice um, time to actually solve problems, make mistakes. There's nothing right about it. So you need to actually um, have a bit of time. But so take home for this activity would be use something which is um, nice and simple. The foil is a simple thing to do. Use some things that you find in your, in your um, drawers, such as the wooden spoons, things that are safe. Um, and think about how you might be able to use some type of artist um, or some, some artwork that, that might stimulate or look at it. So I'm not sure if you happen to have a, you know, a, some outdoor public sculpture somewhere that you could take your child to look at. You could combine this activity with your Voices of Children activity. That's why I showed that one first, because you might combine those two and you might take them out to take some photographs of looking up um, at some sculptures, you know, in, in somewhere on the, um, on your walk. You tend to find there's not very many places in the world now that don't have public sculptures um, as part of the, um, the environment. They, they sometimes call them plop sculptures because they're not pop sculptures, but plop sculptures because they've actually been plopped somewhere. In other words, they're just positioned. Um, and very simply, um, lots, you know, when I, talk to schools and I say to them, oh, you know, try and find some real sculptures that students can look at. The best place to go and find them is sometimes shopping centers. 
because shopping centres are places that tend to have um, a bit of sculptural work spread throughout and they tend to use the space within the, the, sh um, the shopping centre to actually be able to do that, which is interesting. Now, I want to, um, sorry, I've just jumped ahead a bit because I'd like to show you just a little bit of, um, of the first video um, and it's about how you'd actually document your artworks using a phone camera. Now, this, is, this is, has been written for, um, sorry, this has been developed for adults probably, but it's a really handy one so that when you're actually talking um, to your child about how, take, how to take a photo, and, and if you're not sure about how to take a good photograph, this little quick video might actually help. So we'll have the video now, thanks. This video will show you how to document your artwork with your camera phone so that it can be critiqued and graded in an online class. Begin by finding ideal lighting for your photographs. Most camera phones work best in natural light, so the best option is to find a location with ample but even daylight. This kind of lighting is best for colors and sharpness and prevents the appearance of distracting hot spots and shadows in your images. Indoors, the best location is usually in front of a window when sunlight is not direct or you have curtains that diffuse the light. If you don't have a bright enough indoor location, take your photos outdoors in a shaded area or on an overcast day. If your work is on paper, mount it first to a flat surface such as a drawing board or a piece of foam core. You can place your work on an easel or on the back of a chair or mount it on a wall. Place the work either facing the window or under the window to avoid uneven side lighting. Also, make sure you're not standing between the work and your light source when you're photographing. Turn off any artificial light as mixed lighting will distort the colors of your images and is very difficult to fix afterwards. If your artwork is a painting or a drawing, place the work as flat as possible. Make sure the lens of your camera is parallel with the artwork the lens pointing directly at the center of the artwork. This way, you'll capture the dimensions accurately. If your artwork is leaning, you'll need to adjust your camera angle accordingly to avoid distortions. If you're photographing three-dimensional work, create a background that is as empty and neutral as possible. To make sure the images remain sharp, you can use a tripod with a phone mount. If you don't have these, using a chair back or any other flat surface to rest your hand on will help minimize the movement that can blur your images. Leave a bit of room on the edges of your image to avoid accidentally cropping out any parts of your artwork. You can easily do further cropping in post-production. On your camera screen, turn off your camera's flash. Next, check the focus and exposure of your image. You can adjust the exposure level a few steps if the image seems either too dark or too bright. After you've taken your photo, you can use your camera's edit settings to make further adjustments. Crop out the remaining background to create a clean image. You can also do other editing on your phone, such as adjusting the exposure, colors, and perspective. However, it's recommended to keep this to a minimum as it's easy to overdo. You can also export your image and edit it with photo editing software of your choice. Once you've made the final adjustments to your image, you're ready to submit. Okay. All right. So there's, there's some ideas when you're um, taking some photographs of your children's artworks that you're going to collect and put onto our Voices site. Um, or it's just might be some ideas that you hadn't actually thought of um, in, in the way that you can actually edit photos and so that you, you can make them look much more professional. Um, what I'm going to get do now is I'm going to actually show a, a second video now, which will just give us a nice introduction into talking about the Reggio Emilia approach that I spoke about last week. Because what I wanted to do is last week there was a... Um, a presentation that I had that didn't come across um, very well. It was sort of blanked out for a while. And I'd like to just go over a few of those points again, because I think they're really important. I didn't quite get to the end of them. Um, but we might just start off with the second video, and that might just give us a bit of an inspirational motivation to remember what we were talking about last week. 
Thanks. To me, NIDO represents quality. When you walk into a NIDO service, you, you, you see that the environment is beautiful. Um, but not only that, it's conducive to learning. So the resources are really carefully selected and placed into environments with purpose. Um, the purpose being to facilitate learning alongside educators. At NIDO, we incorporate the Reggio Emilia approach into our curriculum. The approach sees the child as being competent and capable. We set the environment up as a third teacher, allowing the child then to come in and, you know, research or investigate their environment. It's about allowing children to make their own choice and to explore their own potential. I'm going to be a singer and a painter and a doctor. When children feel safe, they will start to explore the environment more and be more open to taking risks and, um, and learning. NIDO recruits the best of the best in terms of our educators and we also invest very heavily in their professional development so that they're always on top of what um, the latest emerging research is around what's good for children. We look for people that consider early education a profession. You know, the majority of a child's brain is developed before they leave our services, so it's a really important role that our educators play. If you've got a team that is here for the right reasons and they're, and they're passionate about what they do, then the children are comfortable really quickly. The food at NIDO is really important to us. The food menu has been developed in consultation and collaboration with the nutritionist to make sure that we're not only meeting children's nutritional needs, but exceeding them. What we know is that unless a child feels safe, secure and supported, they can't learn. So we need to nurture their social and emotional well-being first, and then we can layer in the additional learning that needs to happen alongside it. So it's really important for children to be able to understand what it means to be part of a group and how they can communicate as part of a group. We don't prepare children for school. We believe that a three-year-old needs to be a three-year-old when they're three. They don't need to be prepared for being a four-year-old. Learning through play and loving what they do and just coming here and enjoying themselves. You know, every parent wants that for their child. Do you know what stabilizers are? Well, that was just a little um, video from um, one of the early learning centers called NIDO. And the reason that I chose that was because, I mean, it's probably fairly typical of um, most early childhood centers that you would find. Um, but why I chose it was because it does mention that they, they come from um, a Reggio Emilio um, philosophy. And just to very quickly recap, um, you know, the, the Reggio approach um, is not necessarily a, a, a model, sorry, it's not necessarily a philosophy, um, and it's not necessarily a theory about how children learn, but it's much more about, um, it, it's a model for education, and that's, they, they've adopted it. That would have been a really lovely video to actually splice into sections and have a look at it and sort of see, well, what is it that they're doing at that early learning center? Um, that means that they're sort of adopting it. And what I've been trying to do is because this, this whole series is about parenting in a pandemic um, and the sorts of things that you might want to do with your children um, at home so that you can actually help them. And especially if um, they know that there are lots and lots of people who have their children at home at the moment and can't even send them to, um, to their early childhood centres, then what some of the things that you might be able to adopt and the, is there some things about this Reggio Emilia approach to um, education for, for preschoolers um, is that something that you could possibly um, do in your home to to get that way so I'm just going to um, open up a, a another presentation the one that hopefully <laughs> this one will work last last week uh, we were a bit disappointed because it didn't actually um, come through and let me just get rid of that one. And we'll click on this one. Um, all of this high tech stuff, and I'll come down here to share my screen. 
And we'll go to this one and we'll share and hopefully I'll keep my fingers. Well, we went to that one. We'll just go back to the beginning. Um, and hopefully we, um, you are now seeing it and I won't have to rush through it like I did last week where you missed most of it. Because I've got some lovely photographs here that I think that you might enjoy as well. So very, very quickly recap because um, we haven't got much time. But Reggio Emilia is, um, is the name of a town. It's the name of a town in Italy. Um, and after the Second World War, what happened was that they um, developed a, a model of education that they thought was important. And it's one where um, it has some particular um, differences to the, the to the traditional um, type of education that was happening at that time. So it has impacted a lot across the world um, and it's impacted a lot on the way that we teach children and the way we think about children, more importantly. Um, and these are some of, the, some of the dot points or the things that are, are important. And while we're going through this, it would be really nice if you could actually just think about, well, what, what could I do at home to do this one? And so the first one is that they enhance learning in the centres through real life experiences. So that's talking about, um, you know, children doing things, not just being told about what things are about. It's a bit like my little sculpture walk. You know, I could have, I could have spent a couple of hours talking about, you know, artists and sculptures and what is a sculpture and what is it made from with Riley. But taking her out and giving her a real life experience of actually walking along and looking at the sculptures and touching them, photographing them, spending time with them. All of those things is what was enhancing the learning. And at the end of it, she had a really good grasp of what a sculpture was. And the funny thing is she said to me at one point, you know, a water bubbler, what we call a water bubbler, which is where you, you know, get water from. Um, she said, a bubbler is not a sculpture, you know. So I thought that was quite clever because she figured out that even though it was a structure and it was made from steel, she didn't think it was a, a sculpture because it just it wasn't creative enough. The second one is that there's the children have an innate and natural love for discovery. They want to play with things. They want to discover. They want to look. They want to see. They want to pull things apart. They, you know, they, it's just a natural thing. And sometimes what we do is, um, what we do with children is that they actually end up um, sort of, we move away from that act of discovery um, in some ways. So what we do is that we sometimes set up things for them and they, they can't discover. So as a parent, um, think about the sorts of things that you might be able to do with your child where they're actually discovering new things. The other one is respect for others. This is an interesting one that um, the Reggio Emilia approach um, really pushes. And that's the idea is that children need to socialise and understand and grow up with other people. And one of those things is that they need to respect others. Now that's something that young children sometimes don't know how to do. And sometimes they, they, you know, they will get into fights and there'll be a bit of conflict or they, they snatch away a toy. So one of the things that needs to be is that they need to be taught how to respect. And so therefore you need to actually set up some type of activities where they can actually work together. And this is why play groups and things like that are fantastic. It's not really helping in the pandemic because quite often children are just being um, staying at home, but the, the Reggio Emilia approach would, would say that they need to work in groups and that so that they respect others' ideas and they respect others' property and they respect um, th so that somebody else can actually have a go. So their office, their philosophy is the, what they refer to as the image of the child. And the image of the child is that they are imaginative, and they're curious and they're creative. And that's the important thing about all of these webinars that we've been presenting, is that we need to figure out activities that we can do at home that keep children curious, use their imagination and allow them to be creative. Children are capable of constructing their own learning. Now that's an interesting one because that's when they talk about the idea of, you know, if the, the curriculum is not set in concrete and the curriculum can actually change and your child could do the same thing. One morning they might be excited and interested in their toys. Another day they might be excited about 
things like their pets, and it may change from day to day. But what happens here in this approach is that the children are actually the ones that are leading in the constructing of their own learning. Parents should be able to provide a rich learning environment and support. So that means having things on hand, gathering things, things that are safe, but things that are interesting. I mean, this is this lovely little photograph here. You know, there's, there's bits and pieces in there that children would find fascinating that we wouldn't even think to, you know, to gather together. So there's lots of textures, there's lots of shapes, and you could do things with shapes, and then you could do things by sticking down with textures. You could do things by grouping, just putting those things back together, put all the rocks together, put all the screws together, put all the paper clips together, um, allows children to actually um, work in that manner. It's child-centered and it's project-based. So in other words, what it is, is the child is the center of the learning. Um, and quite often it will be a theme based of some type. There should be new learning opportunities which are coming from play. Children enjoy playing um, and then once they're playing, that's when they're starting to learn things about respect. They're learning about problem solving. They're learning about sharing. They're learning about um, not everything's the same. I'll just see what this one. Um, Children should take risks, explore, explore and investigate. Quite often what we do is we put them into a bit of a bubble. Um, and so children need to be able to do that. Learning should be social. So in other words, in a Reggio Emilia approach, they, they, they put children together around tables. They work together as a group. There's lots of group activities happening. Children like to work on their own sometimes, but it's also good for them to socialize. They also say that conflict is okay, as it allows children to argue, discuss and reason. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, children need to respect others and listen to different opinions. So it's quite common in these classrooms for somebody to actually, um, in these centers for somebody just to say, wait, listen, somebody else has got something to say, listen to what they've got to say, um, rather than just sort of going ahead Parents can support the learning. Now, if this is an important one. So what it's saying is, how do you balance this out as a parent? How do you, how do you not take over the learning? And how does it become constructive for the child? So that you're there as a support person. You're not a person that's actually leading it. So parents can stand back and look at their children. They can observe what they're doing, learn from what the children are doing. You know, this is the, there's lots of things that I, um, I know that when I'm working with my grandchildren now and I'm not working in a centre um, because I'm, I'm not a, I can't get to centres at the moment. Um, so I'm learning a lot from my grandchildren and they, and they come up with the same sort of things. I can learn from them. Okay, so I'll just get rid of that and I'll stop sharing. And so what I'd like to do now is I'm just going to show the, um, the third video, which just sort of sums up exactly what I've been talking about. Can I have the third video? Thanks. Every year of a child's life is precious, but when it comes to development, the first seven are the most important. This is when a child becomes the person they are going to be. It is when they develop a sense of self-worth and confidence in a variety of social contexts that will remain with them for life. At Reggio Emilia Early Learning Centre, topics of interests are captured by talking to children. The educator takes the child's interest and turns it into a learning process and allows the child to share and develop their own knowledge with the educator and their peers. Children learn about themselves and the world around them through investigation and discovery. The Reggio Emilia approach considers collaborative group work, both large and small, to be extremely valuable and necessary to advance all areas of development, such as language, cognitive and social development. Children are encouraged to dialogue, analyse, compare, negotiate, conceptualise and problem solve through group work and project work. 
Our educators are passionate and driven professionals who undergo special induction process when they join, followed by monthly training sessions. Reggio Emilia Early Learning Centres are easily accessible to all our parents. Book a tour now. Enrolments open. Phone 02 9891 2225. Email mail at reggioemilia.com.au. Okay. All right. Sorry if that sounded a little bit of like an ad for a, a particular um, learning center. It wasn't really. I just was more interested in the first part of it, which have sort of summarized all of those dot points that I talked about. The lovely thing about the Reggio Emilia approach, and if you want to know more about it, you know, there's heaps that you can look and find. The lovely thing about it is that it actually places the child at the center. So in other words, the child is important. And um, what, what their philosophy is about, and if we go back to sort of um, Malaguzzi, who is, the, who is the founder, he said that the children have a hundred languages. And I wanna just finish off this little segment now before we have some questions and answers with just what does he mean by a hundred languages? the hundred languages of children. So if we can have the fourth video, that would be fantastic. The hundred languages. No way the hundred is there. The child has a hundred languages. A hundred hands. A hundred thoughts. A hundred ways of thinking. A way of speaking. A hundred's always a hundred. Ways of listening, of marveling, of loving. A hundred joys for singing and understanding. A hundred worlds to discover. A hundred worlds to invent. The hundred worlds to dream. The child has one hundred languages. And a hundred, hundred, hundred more. But it's still ninety-nine! The school and the coach separate the head from the body. They tell the child to think without hands. To think without hands. To listen and not to speak. To understand with a job. To love and to marvel only at Easter and at Christmas. They tell the child to discover the world all in the And of the hundred, they steal 99. They tell the child that work can play. Reality and fantasy. Science and imagination. Sky and earth, reason and dream of things that do not belong together. And thus they tell the child that the, that the hundred is not there. The child says, no way, the hundred is there. Okay, I love it. The hundred is there. So what, what they're saying is that poem is written by Malaguzzi and you, uh, and if you see it a couple of times that you can understand it better, but what it's saying is that, you know, that children, should be able to sort of explore and understand and look at things and, and look at it from a child's point of view. So it's not necessarily what, it's interesting, it sort of gives you the impression that, you know, once they start school, a lot of that lovely innate um, inquiry that they have is sometimes taken away. And, and we know that, and in, in, in fact, that's right. Um, you know, there, there are some schools that are still very formalized in the way that they approach things, which is a very different way. But hopefully, um, early learning centers and early childhood centers um, shouldn't operate in that way. They should be just the opposite. It should be a place where children can explore and play and try and make an understanding of the world. So what, is, what does that mean? Let's just bring it all together because we've had like um, two weeks now where we've, it's, the webinars have actually tried to explain the idea of um, what this approach means, um, what does it mean for me in my, my house, you know, what, what sort of things can I do to help my child? And so what, 
I would like to put out there and just ask you is, you know, why is, why is creativity important? What is it about creativity that's, you know, it's, it's about, you know, it's not necessarily the science, the maths or whatever. So creativity is about visual arts. It's about dance. It's about music and it's about all of those things. And sometimes people don't sort of even understand that, um, you know, that creative responses um, have some, cognitive responses that go with it and this is the important thing as an educator I've spent most of my life trying to explain to people that you, you know that you can actually have um, cognitive responses that are coming from creative activities as much as you can from a science activity or a maths activity or a reading activity or whatever it might be so what is it about a creativity and child development that's important well number one is that it's about self-expression, okay? So when, when you're actually visually doing something in a creative response, it's about expressing yourselves in a particular way. And all artists do that and young children do that. So the idea is that they actually um, have some type of expression which is coming from themselves. It's not necessarily something and, and some, so that makes it really quite easy when you start to pick up and think, huh, is, is this a good thing? Is the colouring in books good for my child? Well, is it self-expression? Mm, no. Is it about the child expressing themselves? Mm, possibly not. So, you know, they're the things that we need to do. But if you're thinking about it, well, what does it, how does it develop children? And what you should be thinking about then is things like, um, you know, it's the way they think about things. They, you know, when they, you know, if we think of our simple little, Geocomedy um, sculptures that we were doing. There's a huge amount of problem solving that has to go on to get that to work. There's a huge amount of problem solving happening to make that little sculpture stand or to make it look like a head or to make the arms bend in a particular way um, so that you haven't got three bends in the arm because when you stand there like this, you don't have three bends. You know, you've only got this one, this one, and this one. It's, um, so that, that's important. So it, it allows children to actually develop their imagination um, and and to, to going with the developing their imagination is then it's also about problem solving. Um, it helps with their emotional health. So in other words, if you think about um, people with a hobby, people who enjoy doing things, um, quite often they're, they're quite comfortable in themselves when they're working. And, and children will be a little bit frustrated and they'll come to you and say, can you draw me a horse? You know, my horse is not working. Quite often what will happen there is that it's more the parents saying your horse doesn't quite look like a horse. That doesn't seem to be a problem with a three-year-old. Um, a two-year-old is quite happy to be able to be drawing circles or doing scribbles or whatever it might be. And as I said, in the next few weeks, we're going to look at the development of children and, and what does that mean? So it helps with emotional health. The important thing, if I was saying to parents now, is that it's more about the process that a child goes through, like this, all right? The process that, the, that you go through where you're, where you're looking at the sculpture, you're finding the materials, you're looking at um, an artist and how they actually solve the problem, you're looking at um, developing something which is creative and it's a personal response, um, and then it's not about the product. I mean, at the moment, this looks like a wooden spoon with a bit of foil over the top of it. But that's not what a child's going to think. A child's going to think that it's actually lovely and it looks like a human um, and it's got arms and it's got legs or whatever it might be. So as parents, what does it mean and how does this help? So if you have any questions now, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up on that section. Um, and if you have questions, just please um, put them up on our chat board if you've got some. We'll put your hand up if you've got that, that option and, and we might see if there's any there. I've got a couple of questions that people have asked if nobody's going to ask some at this point. I'm very happy if you've got some, some ideas or even if it's not a question, even if you've got an idea about this is right or this is wrong or what does it mean for me and my child in my home? We're all very quiet at this note. Okay. All right. So let me, let me have a look at the questions that somebody's already sent to me beforehand. All right, so as a parent, can I adopt some of the approaches to this um, Reggio approach? Yes, you can. 
right? The, right, the first one would be think of the things that you're setting up for your child um, to make sure that they're actually, um, that the processes that they're going through and the things that they're enjoying are, are very um, creative in responses. So in other words, think about if I'm going to do an art activity with my child. Now we've done drawing, we've done printing, we've done clay work, and now we've done some sculpture work. Um, so what, what will happen is, is that it, when you do something, quite often what, and this is not only parents, this is teachers as well. Um, we get, sometimes get very frustrated with teachers because they will sometimes do an activity that's a bit of a fun activity but it's all over and done within five seconds. You know, squirting out of a bottle, bit of fun, that's nice. But what, where is the problem solving there? Or where is the creativity in that activity? Or where is something where it's more of a process than just getting a product at the end of it? Quite often, a lot of um, Easter activities or lots of, um, crisp, you know, lots of activities that um, parents do tend to be things that are um, very short lived um, and, and very much repeated and, you know, in those sorts of things. So my, my number one thing that I would say to parents is that if I'm giving something for my child to do, is it a process or is it a product? Um, and really the process is something that you can work your way through. And on the other side of things, is it, um, is it something that's going to be finished too soon? Is there lots of materials? And then every week I keep saying um, that one of the things that I think is really, really important is the fact that you communicate with your child. So in other words, take some time to talk, question. Um, if we take that first activity that I had where we went for our sculpture walk, when you take your child for a sculpture walk in the next week, um, or if you take your child out with your camera and your iPad and your digital um, in your iPhone and you're talking to your child about looking up or looking down because I've got two themes now, looking up and looking down, talk to them about what can you see. Get them to close their eyes and say, you know, put your hands over your eyes and say, if you had your eyes shut and you had to picture what was above you, what do you think might be there? And even if they say, look, it's a tree, it's the clouds or whatever, that's what I started off with Riley. We talked about the clouds um, and we talked about trees. And then she went from there because then when we started on our walk, we saw buildings, we saw bridges, we saw Luna Park, the um, fun places, lots of things. You could lie on the ground and look up and get some ideas as well. So when, we, when you're doing this one, and this week is about looking down, um, uh, let me show you. When we did the Voices of Children project, which went across 14 countries, the most things that we got from children without being told to look down, was they took pictures of their shoes or they took pictures of their shadows. So I'm going to be really interested to see this week whether, whether children, your children, actually decide to take pictures of shadows because that was a really fascinating one for them. So look for those sorts of things. When you think about, you know, Lawrence, Loris Malaguzzi from the Emilio approach, he said this, he said, creativity became more visible when adults were more attentive to the cognitive processes of children than they were to the result. So let's unpack that in this last minute and a half. What does that mean? Creativity becomes more visible when adults were more attentive to the cognitive process, processes. So in other words, if I'm just setting up a little activity for children to do, which is about problem solving or it's about um, you know, being creative and it's about getting those cognitive processes happening and thinking and applying and doing things, then that was much more visible when adults were attentive to that than they were when they were just looking at the result. So in other words, it does, you know, the, the colouring in picture is a good example of that one. So children need to encourage, they need to be encouraged and they need to be supported um, and to develop their creativity. And your role, as a parent, is to make sure that you've got some activities for them to do, and as well as some activities to do, some resources that they can use. And what I've tried to do over this, this whole idea is to use cheap resources that you can find in your kitchen, um, in your kitchen drawers. So at that point, I think I might just leave it there 
and I hope that um, next week we're going to do some interesting things. We're going to be messy next week. Um, it's not going to be a nice tight little um, activity. We're going to do some messy, messy activities um, and we're going to do some things like make some paints and do outdoor activities and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So until next week, thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.